So the last time Ben Gulak was with us, he was this young whippersnapper. I can't remember. Ben, were you 17 or 18? I think I was 19 at the time. You were 19, and uh, he had concocted sort of in his uh, garage uh, th this extraordinary motorcycle. It, it had one wheel, so you have to imagine a fully automated unicycle. Uh, great looking design. Thank you. And, uh, and we were all expecting that any day now he'd pull up or, or, or some dealer would pull up and have these things on offer. Um, he spent the intervening years, I think, trying to commercialize the motorcycle, so I hope you bring us a little up to date of that development. You'll see, you'll see the development for sure, yeah. yeah. But in the interim, he's decided he needed a little schooling. So he, he's gone back to MIT to find out what it is that he's been doing all these years. Um, <laughs> And, and I hear there's one other kind of fabulously insane teenage invention. It's, it's the mini tank. You'll see the photos of it. Okay. Well, you carry well. on. Tell us what you're right. up to. Thank you, Moses. <laughs> Three years ago, I thought I knew it all. I had the world by the tail, and life was looking pretty good. I just won a big deal on Dragon's Den, was accepted into MIT, and I was about to revolutionize the transportation industry. I thought I knew it all then, and I was quick to let you know it. Now, I know much less, and I'm here to tell you how it happened. Actually, I'm here to talk about how I learned all the things I don't know, and how I hope to learn the things I've yet to learn, and how I'm going to learn them. All joking aside, what did I really learn about learning? I learned the importance of planning, and that you have to, but you also have to be able to be fluid and shake things up when needed. I learned to be humble, a bit of a change from a few years ago, and I learned to learn as much as I can from others. I also realized the importance of communicating. You have to be able to articulate your ideas and thoughts well in order to achieve things. Over the past few years, I've really had to learn how to be fluid and flexible. My strategies have been constantly changing. The UNO is a perfect example of this. It's been a constant evolution. What started off as a science fair project has turned into a startup company developing a self-balancing unicycle, is now making a transforming electric motorcycle that's being sold as a marketing tool. So how did this happen? All of these changes happened over three years, and none of them were in the original script. Well, part of the process of trying to commercialize the UNO meant making it go safer and faster. Well, how do you make a unicycle safe at high speed? So we're having all these brainstorming sessions, thinking about retracting training wheels or emergency landing gear. And then one of the engineers suggested, what if we actually make the UNO change shape while it's speeding up to make it more stable? It sounds simple, right? Well, now. Our unicycle has <laughs> Well now our unicycle has three wheels. It transforms into a full street bike while it's moving, and here's a short clip of it in action. So now we have a bike, I mean Uno, that's fast, safe, reliable, and is the world's first transformer. This is definitely not part of the original plan. The next step is to start selling them, right? Well, again, this is something that's easier said than done. Turns out that Segway spent over $250 million, that's a quarter billion dollars, trying to certify the Segway for sidewalk use. Well, my Uno transforms, is faster, and way more dangerous than the Segway, and is supposed to go on roads. So I quickly realized I'd never be able to raise the kind of capital I needed to actually commercialize the Uno. But I still had a bunch of investors that I had to pay back. So I started thinking of new ways to commercialize it. I realized that a lot of companies at some of the trade shows I was going to were spending millions of dollars on uh, marketing and on booth space, trying to draw in traffic, getting YouTube, Facebook, and Google hits. I also knew that every time we brought the Uno to one of these shows, we'd get X amount of Facebook posts, Y amount of YouTube hits, and Z, Z amount of Google vlogs. 
These are all tangible, quantifiable numbers that I can put a value on that companies will appreciate. And we're actually now in negotiations with the company to sell the Uno. I've had to accept that the only constant thing is change, and that no matter how much planning I do, things are always going to be delayed. Projects take longer than they're expected, legal issues pop up, costs rise, and for some reason development always takes lo longer than it's supposed to. As a result, I'm better at managing the emotional roller coaster that's become my life. When I first got started, it was really difficult to focus. When good things were happening, I'd have a natural high, and it would be tough to stay grounded. And when bad things were happening, it was tough to stay positive. Now, when things don't go according to plan, I'm able to keep a more even keel. And I really have accepted that the only constant is change, and also that things always seem to have a reason for happening. So my second lesson, which is the importance of being humble and a willingness to keep learning. This means know your limitations. When I first got started, I didn't know anything about running a business, hiring and managing a team, developing a product, or even raising real money. I had to accept that I couldn't do it all. My instinct was I wanted to be involved in every step of the process and make every decision. And I quickly realized that it wasn't in the company's best interest to be the guy making all of these decisions. I needed more qualified people. This was difficult for me to accept because I did want to micromanage. And it really took a lot of effort to be hands off and trust the people that I'd surrounded myself with. But in the end, I have a team of self-driven, independent people where each person helps grow the company themselves. I've also learned to capitalize off of other people's experience. I've tried to surround myself with the smartest and best people I can in both the business and engineering worlds. We have an incredible advisory board and a great team of engineers. I'm also really fortunate to have a great business partner in my latest project that's developing the shredder. And I'll show you a video of that right now. So on a side note, we're actually in the final stage of closing a $4 million venture capital round and are on schedule to bring the shredder to production this year. So, so by surrounding myself with good people, I've really been able to learn from their experiences and mistakes. I'm a huge believer in mentorship programs. Now, if I have a difficult problem or you know, I need to make a decision in the company, I can call up one of my advisors or mentors and hear how they dealt with similar problems when they were first getting started. And this has been an invaluable resource, and it's helped me avoid numerous crises over the last few years. Finally, by surrounding myself with people who've gone through this before, I know that I'm not doing it alone. It's really easy to feel isolated being an entrepreneur. There's lots of travel, lots of lonely hotel nights, and there's always problems, the biggest one being there's never enough money. Having mentors and a good team around me reminds me that it's a team effort and you know, we're all moving forward as a group, and that's made a huge difference. 
My last lesson is about good communications. Our newest project, The Shredder, spans four very different worlds. We're doing work with the US government, top extreme sport athletes, developing new technology, and raising venture capital money. So how do we bridge all these gaps between finance, technology, military, and sports? Through mirror neurons. 20 years ago, the Italian researcher Giacomo Rizzolatti was doing a research study on neural activity in monkeys as they ate grapes. After about 30 minutes of watching the monkey eat the grapes from the bowl, Giacomo started to feel a little peckish himself. He leans in, picks up the grape, and pops it in his mouth, all with the monkey watching. Giacomo realized that the same neurons fired in the monkey's brain as if the monkey himself were the one that had just eaten the grape. Giacomo had just discovered mirror neurons, which were they are the neurons that are responsible for our very success as a species. They're what are responsible for empathy. They're what let our first caveman ancestors know whether an animal or person was aggressive or passive. Should they fight or flight? Were they safe? Being able to read what animals and people were thinking meant survival. And in today's business world, survival means being able to effectively understand and communicate with people. I've learned to belong in four very different worlds, which is an important part of our business model, because we're not just developing an extreme sports vehicle. We're developing a platform that has the potential to save lives around the world, while developing new technology and growing the business. We're trying to change the transportation and power sport industry. Obviously, I don't dress and speak the same when I'm in a meeting with someone like Jake Brown, who's a professional skateboarder, or with my lawyers, who are incidentally in the audience today. The important thing is to change your communication style and your clothes, but not change who you are, what you believe in, or your values. The trick is to change how you're actually saying things without changing what you're saying. And this trick is called code switching. And it's an essential evolutionary trait that's been incredibly helpful for me in communicating with people. The three lessons I've learned have had a huge impact in my life and have really taught me how much I still have to learn. Learning to plan but still be fluid. Learning to be humble and willing to learn from others. And how to communicate effectively have had a major positive impact in my life, and hopefully it'll be helpful to some of you. I'm sure in another three hours I'll know even less, but I'm happy to come and tell you guys about it. <laughs> so thank you. So I'm still hoping to get a couple of those machines on stage, Ben. You sh they're in Brampton. You in Brampton. In Brampton. Oh, great. So they're Can closer than last time. Yeah. How long would it take to drive one down from Brampton? Ryan? <laughs> Come on, you got two more days. <laughs> you really want one here? Sure. We could probably... I don't know about in the theater, they probably... Ryan, you're, Ryan you're the person to ask. Can we have one? Road <laughs> trip. We'll, we'll see what we can do. It'd be great. Maybe you can bring one to the closing party. I know after a couple of drinks, many of you will want to try the shredder. With all those hills around your house, it'd be perfect. That'd be great. Thanks very Thank much, Dan.